our brother Ashish will read a portion of this session. <coughs> Therefore, while the promise of entering his rest still stands, let us fear lest any of you should seem to have failed to meet it. For good news came to us just as to them, but the message they heard did not benefit them because they were not united by faith with those who listened. For we have for we who have believed entered that rest. As he has said, as I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Although his works were finished from the foundation of the world. Verse 9. So then there remains the Sabbath rest for the people of God. For whoever has entered God's rest has also rested from his works as God did from his. Let us therefore strive to enter that rest so that no one may fall by the same sort of disobedience. The uh, subject, rest, um, as outlined in Hebrews, is one that's interesting, one that we probably don't talk about often. But we, applying the same four questions, we want to understand what is this rest, this rest of God, this Sabbath rest? What is it that God has in store for his own? Um, we want to ask the question, what is it? We want to ask, what is it that God is supplying? What is What need is being met? And then we want to ask, how he has secured it, it's something that comes out from his own heart, what he does, what he has done, and he wants us to share in it. And then ultimately, what does it mean for us? This has a present reality for us to experience, but it also has something that looks forward to a day when we will be with the Lord, when we will be in his presence, when we will experience what God had intended way, way back when he began his work with um, human beings, when he mm. began his work, that there was something that he had in mind that we might share and participate in. And so we want to look at it with those same four questions in mind. What is this rest? Um, well, you might, in thinking about it, think about the reference in Matthew 11. Um, and we often quote that one. We hear a lot about that one because it's used in the gospel. It's used to give us help in living. Mm -hmm. um, we have the, <clears throat> come unto me all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Mm -hmm. And then take my yoke upon you and learn from me. And you might find rest for your soul. My yoke is easy, my burden is light. Just to, just to give a distinction, that is different than what we have here in Hebrews. And so with the help of the Spirit, we want to gain uh, an, an appreciation of what God was doing, what he modeled with regards to the children of Israel and the warnings that came along with it, why the many failed to appreciate what God was uh, doing in Israel. And yet there still remains one for the people of God. And we can not only anticipate it as a future event, but enjoy it as a present reality. In our previous uh, studies, I believe we referred on the subject of sanctification, we referred to Genesis 2, uh, verse 3, where God had set, a, set apart the seventh day. But the verse before that, uh, Genesis 2, verse 2, uh, said, When God had finished his work, he rested. And uh, now God does not need rest, beloved. He never sleeps nor slumbers. He can work 24-7, 
365, he does not need rest, but he intentionally rested. And I believe that's where the principle comes from, ceasing from work, uh, and it's a place of, of uh, enjoyment of what God has accomplished on our behalf. The Sabbath, of course, would be a figure of that, the Sabbath day. And that was really given to God's earthly people to, to uh, honor that day. Uh, in the New Testament, we're not commanded at all. It's, it's the one commandment never given in the New Testament or even quoted. In fact, the opposite is said. Uh, we're not to keep the new moons and the feasts and the Sabbaths. Let no man judge you for those. In Galatians, we're told that. But uh, here in Hebrews 4, uh, it's really in, in taken from the thought of entering into the land of promise, right? When the children of Israel left Egypt, they were in the wilderness. Uh, God's intent was, in just a short period of time, they would enter into the land of promise. Uh, and they sin. And he said to that generation in Psalm 95, verse 11, they shall not enter my rest. Now, in that, that context, he's referring to the, the promise of entering to the land of promise. And I think we see there uh, an illustration of the sin that kept them from enjoying the place of blessing. And that's just the principle. But we can see in the scriptures here that it is applied now to faith in Christ. So now, how do we enter into this rest? How do we cease trying to strive and work to earn favor with God? How do we do that and please him by obedience, by believing in the Lord Jesus? They're all connected. Justification, sanctification, you know, all of these, forgiveness of sins, all of these are connected with faith in Christ. And we have this brought out here. It's a beautiful principle. So to enter into the rest means that you have stopped working. And you're also going into the place of blessing and promise that God had intended. Uh, and that's by faith. It's all by faith in what Christ has done. In verse 3 it says, For we who have believed do enter that rest. So this is it. Faith. Believing. That's how we enter into it. And believing... In what? Believing in the Lord Jesus, of course. Brother Mark, if you would allow me to touch a bit on the rest that you have mentioned, because in Matthew 11, that rest gives me the right for the eternal rest. That uh, for many of us, we know that, but for the new generation, I think we should take hold of that truth. Because out of the treasure, there's new and old things. There are, as far as I know, four types of rest in the scripture. In Matthew 11, there are two of them. The first one is a rest for the conscience. You're heavy laden, you come to me, and I will give you rest. A rest for the conscience. In the scripture, there are twofold rest for the soul. For there is the yoke of the Lord Jesus. As long as we learn of him, we shall find rest for our souls. But also in Jeremiah, when he speaks about the old path, and you stick with the old path and you shall find rest for your soul. So there is a rest for the conscience. There is a rest for the soul. And when we come to the gospel of Mark and chapter 6, I like to think that Mark chapter 6 is identical to, for us in today, when the Lord Jesus told his disciples, come with me and rest for a while. It was a temporal rest, but it was a rest in the presence of the Lord Jesus to rest for a while. And I always like to think that our gathering like this, our midweek meeting coming from the world and all the craziness of it, we can enjoy rest in the presence of the Lord Jesus for a while. But that rest in the presence of the Lord Jesus for a while is leading us to that eternal rest that Hebrews tells us about. So just to, to share these four aspects for you at your own leisure to look at them. The rest for the conscience, the rest for the soul, the rest for a while, and then the eternal rest of God.
told us that uh, the rest in connection with the work of God toward us. Yes. Can I bring also the other side of it, which is the rest of God concerning himself. Twice we read about God resting. The first one we have mentioned in Genesis chapter 2. And as we will said it clearly, it is not a rest of being tired. It is a rest because Hebrews uh, 4.11 said it ceased from work. The work is done. There is nothing to do in creation anymore. So there is no evolution. Finish everything. The work is done completely. And as a result of that, God rested from the work of creation. The creation was a platform that God have provided to show what was in his heart in connection with the Lord Jesus Christ. It wasn't really in connection with Adam. He brought all of that to bring his eternal purpose concerning his man, the Lord Jesus Christ. And those are the tactical ways to get us there. Creating Adam, sin comes in, all of these things. But God's eternal pur purpose that everything will be head up in Christ. So when that work of creation was finished, God rested. But there is another rest, and that is concerning God, and that's in Zephaniah. Now, Zephaniah is one of those small prophets, minor prophets in the Old Testament. So I'm not starting from Hosea, so... Take us sometimes. Let me go backward. The last book in the Old Testament is Malachi. The one before that is Zechariah. The one before that, Haggai. So if you go backward, and then the one before that is Zephaniah. And let's go to Zephaniah chapter, the last chapter of Zephaniah. There are three chapters there. Yes, Zephaniah chapter 3 and verse 17. The Lord thy God is in the midst of thee, is mighty. He will save. He would rejoice over thee with joy. He would rest in his love. He would joy over thee with singing. So what Brother John was mentioning that is really happening in between the creation where God rested and you brought um, the eternal rest. Here is the eternal rest. God would rest. From the whole work is done now. But what, what he would rest in, it is not the beauty of the creation or the magnificent of the creation or the, the, the glory of the creation. Also, all of that true. He would rest in his love. What love have brought to his heart, the satisfaction of his own heart for all eternity, that is the rest of God. The rest of God is his love had accomplished what satisfied his own heart and satisfied the heart of his only, of his only beloved son. The beauty about it is this, that we are part of that. He would rest in his love. He will joy over thee with joy. He will joy over thee with singing. It, what a triumph, a climax of love. That God would see all of that. He's not going to say, and it was all very good. That was a statement. There was no singing. But when he see what love has done, the glorification of his son, the many sons to glory, that, that, that those who are bearing his beautiful image, those who are surrounding him, his brethren, when God sees all of that, he would sing. He would joy and he would rest in his love. Would you think that that's what the hymn writer captures when in hymn seven he says, When all things filled by thee are wholly blessed, and God's deep love eternally shall rest in that which ever speaks to him of thee, thy greatness, Lord, the universe shall see. It seems to me that there's a capturing of those thoughts in the hymn. Uh, Mr. Rossier in 498, almost the last hymn in our book, mm -hmm. Perfect Eternal Rest. Yes. So it's really the complacency of God that... Go back to creation when he rested, as you pointed out, both you and Brother Bill, 
pointed out that it was not a matter that God was tired, so he has to sit down and take a nap. No, but he looks out on creation and it satisfied his own heart that it had achieved what he had in view. So likewise, when it comes to the eternal rest, he's going to look out with great complacency and delight. This, this subject sort of deviates from our four questions because there's really no need here. <laughs> right? It's really out of the largeness of God's heart that he brings us into this atmosphere, if we can use that word, he uses us into this climate where his love finds its rest and he says, that's the destiny I have for my people. Yeah. That's the destiny I have for you and me. That when you got saved, you, you, all you were thinking about perhaps was my guilt and my need for forgiveness. And God has somewhat similar in, in view. He says, I want to bring you into communion and fellowship with myself, with my son. I want you to have that completely as your outcome, your, your, your something to look forward to, something that will be um, satisfy his heart mm. as his, his love is set on you. There, there is a need to ask the second question, though. I, I think, Mark, you said that there's no need to ask the second question, but I think we should. Why is rest needed? So um, I think part of the answer to that question is in, in Hebrews 4, verse, uh, I believe it's verse 10. For he who has entered his rest has himself also ceased from work from work from his works as God did from his so the the truth of entering into this rest for the believer is there is to remove the the thought that I have to work to please God to to be um, accepted by him so just to remove that it's not by works uh, lest any man should boast it's by faith it's the grace of God that gives us the faith and actually the work is us we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus, Ephesians 2, verse 10. So it's been reversed on us. And to enter the need to have this is that we don't feel or even think anymore like those that were being written to of Jewish background, that by keeping the law or keeping a set of rules, somehow I'm working to please God so that I'll be accepted by God. Uh, that idea and that concept, that philosophy is removed. That's how I enter into his rest. I no longer have to strive. I no longer have to work. Uh, not that those works would accomplish anything anyway, but I might have thought they would. And God is saying, no, this is how you know. I'm not, I'm not doing good works so that God will find favor with me so that I can earn my salvation. I do the good works because I am the Lord's and I'm showing forth Christ's likeness in my heart. <laughs> If I may suggest a, a thought in relation to Hebrews. The Hebrews speaks of, I don't want to say two rests, but I'm going to say two rests. <laughs> okay, just to, make, just to make the difference. There is our rest, and there is my rest, which God speaks of. Our rest is we would rest, dear brethren. We will cease from our own works. You know, now we labor. And knowing that our labor is not in vain in the Lord. So we have this aspect of we're still living in the works and doing the works that prepared for us by God himself. That we're going to rest from. But God desires to bring us into the, like you said earlier, the climax, the peak of the rest. And that is the rest of God himself. If I always looked at it this way, as the brethren have said, it is not I stopped working. To me, I look at it, the rest of God is a rest of celebration. Divine persons celebrating all what God has accomplished for his glory. The new creation. You, I was thinking in the old creation, you have to go to Job to say that God did not sing. But there is the morning stars and the sons of God, they shouted for joy. That is the most we could see in the old creation. But in the new creation, what God has accomplished in the book of Zephaniah. Just to think that I will rejoice over you with singing. We always say that we would love to hear the voice of the Lord Jesus, right? 
I mean, we always wondered in uh, Mark 14, who raised the song when they sung a hymn? It wasn't Dave Daisley, I can assure you. <laughs> but you know what I'm saying, who raised the song? There's none other but the chief musician that I believe that raised the song in Mark 14. So then you come to Hebrews 2, that I have declared thy name unto my brethren, and in the midst of the assembly will I sing praises, and he join us with, rightfully so, I want to hear the voice of the Lord Jesus. But to enter into the rest of God, and hear divine God, God in all his fullness and person, singing over us, with rejoicing over us with singing, Brethren, I don't know, I, I failed to find words to express a little bit of it. If you have better way to explain, please explain to me that God's going to sing over us. It's just something that should really cause us to magnify the grace of God. No wonder in Ephesians it says, to the praise of the glory of his grace. I do agree with you that Dave Daisy is going to have to keep absolutely quiet uh, in his presence. Although but, I like when he starts the hymn. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's for her. <laughs> but I think this matter of rejoicing over us might be connected with the returning prodigal. Because the, there is the coming home, there is the robe, there is the ring, the shoes on the feet, and it said, says they began to rejoice. You never get any indication that it ends. This is the rejoicing that I think the Father's love uh, climaxes uh, the, the moment where there is this complete delight and celebration and rejoicing that the Father has, having us with him, the scene of sin, all gone. Because this is, we are talking about the eternal rest. Sin has been put away. The truth of the Lord Jesus as the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world takes us all the way into that eternal scene where sin is no more. And God can be complacent. God can celebrate his accomplishments. Could we, could we say again, because the matter of rest, and I know my fault, I ran to the eternal state quickly. But there are three, if I think so, for us to enjoy. We enjoy a rest, morally speaking, knowing that the atonement work is done. I rest in the work of Christ. I rest that my sins are taken care of. I rest in the fact that I am justified, that I am reconciled today. I rest in that fact today. As a believer, no... Um, out of my salvation, no losing of my eternal security. I am safe and secure. No one could block me out of his hand. No one could block me out of the Father's hand. That gives me rest. In the day where there is a lot of um, an assurance of salvation, am I saved, am I not saved? No, we are saved. And I rest in that. So that's a rest that I enjoy today. But then in Hebrews, we have remain is the rest for the people of God. I really believe that the millennium also in a figure is a time of rest for the creation in a measure that has been groaning and been tired of its inhabitants with all of the horror and evil that's going on that Brother John in, his, in, the, in, the, in the ministry and the gospel didn't want to read, read the, 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 the horrible sins. I think the earth could not, you know, when I, every time I hear of an earthquake, even that there is one happened in New Jersey, out of everywhere, a month ago or two months ago, I think the earth is just shaking, sick and tired of its inhabitants. I, I just think that the whole, it's groaning, like enough of this. That will be a rest when the Lord Jesus comes as the king of righteousness and maintain righteousness where righteousness will reign in the thousand years. There will be rest in a measure. And then there is a third rest, and that is the eternal rest, which we talked about earlier. But you and I could enjoy that today. In a measure, the rest in the fact that the work, the atonement work is done. The victim blood was shed. It's like rest. He is seated at the right hand of God. The work is done. I have confidence 
and complete rest, nothing will shape my faith or doubt my salvation, even my own feelings. It's because of him. Then I am waiting for that day of rest for the creation when he would reign over the earth and everything will set right. And then, and, and these are all our portion. And then the eternal one where we will enjoy it. I really believe more than anybody. The Christian company, the church of God, will enjoy that rest of God. Because no one have experienced the love of God in, a, in, in its all purity and magnificence than the church of God. Because what raised a wondrous thought, another hymn. And who could ever suggest that we, the church, to glory bro, be with thy son blessed? Oh, the thought of, okay, I'm not recycling the hymn here. But it's really wonderful that you and I have those three aspects of it and we could enjoy it now. Coming into that, what is that to me? Now I'm running to the last question. You know what? The world will become like, no nonsense. Like, you know, it's, what is that in comparison with that? Could, could we, before we move on, because I'm trying to take some notes. <laughs> I'm trying, okay? Um, could we summarize the rest? I, I got what you just said, Emil. There are three, you said there are three. It, morally, you said to start with. Morally. The millennium, and then the eternal state. Right. Those three. Right. Initially, we also started with Matthew eleven twenty eight, right. and we talked about rest for the conscience, a rest for the soul. Does that those two fit in with your morally? Yeah, that's what John was mentioning earlier. Those are the rest that I get. I I I um I experience now. Now, when I accept the Lord Jesus as my my conscience, my my. Uh, my yeah, my so, soul. My soul, yep. We have that now. Right. The millennium is to come. Yes. And the eternal state is to come. Yes. So I, I want to make that clear for everybody. Thank you. We talk about three. One that we can we can enjoy now. <coughs> uh, you know, rest for the but conscience. Only the believer could enjoy. Only a believer. Conscience for the believer and soul we can enjoy now. The millennium is in the future. And then the eternal state is in the future. And, and I could enjoy the millennium now, again, morally. I yeah. mean, he's, he's going to be, low. every knee will bow to him in the millennium. I bow the knee now. Every tongue will confess him in the millennium. I confess him now. I enjoy him being my Lord now. Everyone else will have to do it in the millennium. So there is a, a lot of things that we as a Christian company in this dispensation could enjoy. That is, sometimes it's a shame if I could use that. But you know the reason why? Because I don't think that we grasp this in our souls now. If we did, we can then look ahead and see what you're just what you're saying. That's why we have this Bible. Conference. That's exactly what we're here. <laughs> but we should we should keep in mind that the the, the ultimate rest we look for is the rest of God. Yeah. Yeah. Because the rest of God will never be interrupted with sin again. In the millennium, in a scene of the millennium, there will still be the presence of sin seen in self, not in the world. Let's keep this in mind, not in the world. And Satan is bound for a thousand years, but within self, I, I, the I. So there will be still presence of sin. What you read in second Peter, that we are hastening the day of God, where the whole world is burnt with all its elements. Is it because we don't care about sins to, sinners to be saved? We care. But we are looking forward for that day of God, the eternal rest of God, where sin will have no trace at all in that day of rest of God. And Brother David, I want to come back to Luke 15 because we take the, the prodigal, which is mostly the person, the man. But in the three parables, there is the thought of rejoicing. The first one is in the sheep in relationship to the Lord Jesus. The second one, relationship to the coin of the Holy Spirit. And the third one is the prodigal in relationship to the Father. But in every one of them, there was the rejoicing without end. Because divine persons, we say it respectfully, I don't know how to express it better. They all join in rejoicing of what each one of them has accomplished for the blessing of man and for the rest of God himself.
were just pointing out that in the millennial aspect of the rest, that we can enjoy it presently. We can move on to the reality also that in the, the matter of the eternal rest is also ours to enjoy now. That's why, again, was mentioned Peter's expression, hastening the day of God. Why? Because we long to see God in that place, a position of his rest, because it has been disturbed by sin. And the day that the eternal scene comes in, as we've been pointing out, the rest is there undisturbed. He will rest in undisturbed repose to realize that what his son has done has gathered together everything for the pleasure of the heart of God, which will never ever be marred again by sin. So we can enjoy that pres uh, eternal rest now. But there is food, I think, that we need in order to bring us into rest. And I'm paralleling that to the institution of manna in Exodus uh, 15. Uh, manna comes in prior to the Sabbath being established. So it seems to me that God will provide us with ample spiritual resources so that we can then enjoy the rest that he has in view, his eternal rest. So I, I think it's important to, to, to have ourselves enjoy and feed upon what God has provided because he wants to bring us into his rest. He wants to bring us into it morally. He will bring us into it in, in actuality yet to come. But now we can feed on things that bring us up to the enjoyment of his rest. You think feeding, meaning feeding on Christ, Yes. I am the bread of life, and so on, that feeding on him brings us into yes. the... I want to feed on that line, because in Hebrews chapter 4, he gives us a two enablement, or help, to get us into that rest. So he speaks about the rest in verse 11, he said, um, Hebrews 4 and verse... Um, and verse 11, he said, Let us labor, therefore, to enter into the rest lest any man fall after the same example of the unbelief. So now we are uh, admonished to enter into that rest. But we realize we are in the wilderness. Mm -hmm. And we realize it is very, very difficult for us. We get distracted. We have the flesh in us. The enemy will try to make us miserable. So he brings in the same chapter the two means by which. The first one is in verse 12. After he said, let's labor or let's endeavor to enter into that rest. In verse 12, he brings before us the word of God. And again, it is important. It is very important. Reading the word of God. Kevin and I were talking about in all its entire. Not just to pick one here and the devotional things in the morning are wonderful. But if that's your food, man, you're going to be very skinny like me. <laughs> you, you really, really need to eat. So, sure, a little bite in the morning, but you can't have the whole day on a little bite. None of you do that. I, I saw it lunchtime. I saw those plates. <laughs> same thing with the Word of God. The same thing with the Word of God. How am I going to enter into that risk? How all of the, 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 the fear that's going on around us in the world, how am I going to get from my soul a communication from God to tell me Fear not. I have, how, where am I going to get that? I'm going to get that from the word of God. And that's verse 12. And then in verse 14, we have the other um, help that we have in verse 14. Seeing then that we have a great high priest that passed into the heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we have not a high priest that could not be touched with our infirmities. So what we have also, not the word of God, but we have a person who have gone that pathway before <clears throat> and had conquered and had endured and had accomplished and he know exactly the wilderness harshness. He knows exactly how the enemy could come <clears throat> and trying to divert us from going there, from going into the rest. So we have him there. So what do we do? What's the second thing? Prayer. The word of God and prayer. I say it again. Read your Bible. Pray every day. 
Just as simple as that. But we need, if we want to enjoy that, we need to be serious about what God, it will be again, just sad if we spend all of our life here and then enter into our rest when we get there. Enjoy it here. There is no labor in there that you need to rest from. It's actually needed. Can I say that? It is needed more now than there. And that is what we have. And we have the two provision of grace. We have the word of God. We have a great high priest. I wonder if I can make a contrast just for us to magnify the man of grace. We're talking about rest. And I think we all in full agreement. It's the ultimate rest, the rest of God for his delight and for his pleasure. But yet when you think of the one who made it possible is the Lord Jesus even here. But I just want to talk in relation to the contrast as far as the rest. He provided rest. But I'm always touched by that verse in the book of Ruth. In chapter 3 in the last verse when she was telling, Naomi was telling Ruth, be still my daughter. Be still. And that's something good for all of us. For the man shall not rest. Who is not shall not rest? Boaz. Who is the one who didn't rest when he was here? The Lord Jesus. The one who knows what the rest of God is all about. And the one who enjoys it daily with his God and Father. But yet for your behalf and mine. The man shall not rest. Until he has completed the matter. And dear brethren what a contrast. Of the one who offered the rest for us. But while he was here. He will not rest. Until he has accomplished and finished the work. But we thank God. You know what he said in the Gospel of John. He says, I work and my father works. And how wonderful that the Lord Jesus even till now is working toward, uh, toward his own. You have heard he is the high priest. And he's the advocate. And he is the shepherd, the great shepherd. So he's still working. But what a wonderful thing of that one who provided the rest. He's still working for, uh, on our behalf. Just for the moment to enter into the rest of God. Where he shall not be anymore working. Because he shall rest in his love. It's so important to just highlight these, these two points. Especially the one about the word of God. is Because the contrast of what the writer to Hebrews is saying. Is that the Israelites failed. Because when the message was given to them. And I want to focus on that idea. The message was given. And that message was not coupled with faith. And so we have been today exposed to some messages. Hmm. The messages of God's grace to deal with our need in condemnation, to deal with our need in defilement. And, and, um, and, and he raises us up and he justifies us and he sanctifies us. Um, we receive that from the word that is the gospel that is the message declared so when we leave here it's so important that we couple what we have heard with faith because that is what's going to help us really believe what we haven't seen yet heaven this idea of god's rest is something that is just being told to us objectively this is what god has in his heart to do and so what it has to be coupled with faith as we hear this is what God's plan is. This is what God's intent is for all of his children, that they might sit in repose with him and rest in that love and to enjoy that love even presently. But it comes because I hear that this is what he planned. And then I put faith coupled with it. Otherwise, we end up spinning and being distracted and forgetting that that's our ultimate destiny. Would you say, dear brethren, as long now we know the truth, the word of God brings the truth of rest. But wouldn't you think in a practical way on earth, we should have conditions where the Lord can rest in his, in our localities, in our homes. I want to bring scripture toward it. You know, we know the story of Martha and Mary in Bethany. I believe that the Lord Jesus found a house when he was here on earth where he can rest. He can be at home as it were. And the saints responding, they made him a supper. 
I wonder if should be conditions in our localities, even on Lord's Day, where the Lord is in the midst, but he is resting in the midst of the company. I was thinking the first one who thought of that was Abraham. In Genesis 18, when the Lord with angels came and he expressed himself, he ran toward them. And he said in Genesis chapter 18, he says, please let me fetch some water, you know, to wash your feet and rest yourselves under the tree. Rest yourselves. What a wonderful thing, dear brethren, in light of what we have enjoyed and understood and the truth of one day we shall be in the Father's house in his eternal rest. Can we in return respond on earth and make it possible for the Lord mm. to come into our circumstances and find rest there? I always say to myself, if the Lord will come to my house, would he be at rest? I don't know. Maybe I have to hide a few things, right? But would he? Abraham didn't have to hide anything. Mm. Mary, Martha, and Lazarus didn't have to hide anything. But I feel in our days we have to hide a lot of things where the Lord can find rest in your house, in our local testimonies. May it be that we respond in such a way to it. Sanctification. Mm. Because, and holiness. Because the Lord is not going to come. Without holiness, there is no way. There is no one who could, no man could see God. If our condition personally, in our home, in our local assembly, is not characterized by holiness, where the rights of God are maintained, how could he find rest? Yeah. How could he find rest? So it's a challenging to us. What does it mean to us? Taking the first question here. It is, it means to us that we need, as far as our responsibility is concerned, to maintain those conditions of Bethany. You know, it's, they weren't having the best of everything. You know, Martha had her difficulties. Mary perhaps had her difficulty. Lazarus had his. But there was a condition there. And I really think today, we need to maintain this holy condition in our locality, where the flesh is excluded. And that's really, really important. I think our difficulty is the flesh. That's our difficulty. And the flesh, the mind of the flesh is enmity toward God. And the flesh could act in a pious way. The Pharisees were very, very... You know, following the rule, washing your hands 50 times a day and praying three times a day and fasting more than God had required. And but they weren't holy people. The flesh need to be set aside and the spirit of God need to take control. Just as we said before, sanctified by the spirit of our God. And if that's a condition, I, it's easy to look at somebody else and he said to you, but how about me? What am I doing about maintaining holy condition in my own life before I start telling everybody how to do it? What am I doing in my own little circumstances? And as a result of that, it would be the Lord will find that restful condition. But without holiness, it cannot be. He is not. He is not going to. Remember Laodicea? I'm bringing it to that. Would we say that the Lord have restful condition in that local assembly? He said, I'm going to spit you out. I'm outside the door. Because what is the condition? It's really, I'm rich. I'm increased with good. I'm in need of nothing. We are all self-sufficient here. And we don't need you, Lord. You could stay outside there. There is no rest for him if that's the condition. If you want to maintain, and it's a beautiful thing, that the Lord of glory, the Lord of glory, in the scene where he's rejected, he finds a soul. He finds a person. I, I, can I say a young person? Who is really, the, the Lord said, I want to walk, I think it was mentioned about Enoch walking with God. You know? That delight to the heart of God. Not only older saints, but also young believers from early on in their life. Maintain a condition of holiness where the Lord Jesus finds rest. I wonder if I can give another scripture for it as a proof of the rest and holiness being essential together for responding to the Lord presently. We said that in Genesis 18, the Lord rested 
in the circumstance and the place of Abraham. In fact, when God is resting, he can unfold all his promises toward you. But you know, there was another house, the chapter after, that the Lord refused to go. Why is it? Because he couldn't be at rest in Lot's house. The next chapter, because Lot was his, but it doesn't mean because you are the Lord, he will feel restful, uh, find the restful condition in your own house. Although you are the Lord, because there are certain things that are in opposition to his mind. So that when it came to the house of Lot, it was said that the two angels went toward Lot. And you know what? Uh, Lot lingered. And it was said of the angels, they pulled him out. But the Lord did not go there because he wasn't resting in such an environment. But he rested in Abraham's household. What a wonderful thing, dear brethren, that we can really be committed, even in our own household, that it will be a place where Christ can rest. And it's always said, when we invite the Lord Jesus to rest, he's not only the guest, he becomes the host. So invite him, make a restful condition, and then let him be the host to bring all these wonderful things before you and me. The story of uh, Abraham inviting them, I think there's a lot in there yes. to encourage us and if we read uh, Genesis 18, we'll see he, he starts out by telling them, well, you know, I'll give you some water and some bread. And he runs in and tells Sarah to make the bread. But then he calls a little lad and he says, go get a calf. He didn't say that at first. But I see a growing appreciation and uh, the calf would remind us of the Lord himself, right? The Lamb of God. And he presents that to them as well. So he's showing the appreciation he had for the Lord to the Lord, if I may put it that way. Uh, so as he's uh, restful conditions, we see more and more of the Lord being um, highlighted and shown. Even in that one story, Abraham did not say to them, I'm going to give you a lamb. But he did. And it was like sort of he grew in his appreciation of his guests. And so we have the Lord with us. We'll grow an appreciation of what he's done and who he is. See, when there's rest in our own souls, I think we can think more and more of the Lord. Just in a practical way, beloved. If we're so uh, anxious and distracted with all the things of life, and it just takes up all our thinking and all our thoughts, we can't meditate on the Lord. We can't appreciate him as much as a result. But we just take those times when we can, those opportunities during our quiet days. We should have some quietness in our life. Turn off that television set. You know, Stop listening to certain things and start... Focusing on the Lord and enjoying his word and God's people. Uh, and you'll get rest for your soul in that way too. I hesitate to bring this up. We've got five minutes. We're almost done. But we've been speaking about being in the wilderness. Um, and we realize that the, the Israelites spend a lot more time in the wilderness than they should have. The goal was to go across the Jordan and, and enter into the land. For us, in Ephesians 1, we have been blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenlies. So in reality, and again, time is up, but we should be in the enjoyment of those blessings which are ours. They're ours through Christ. Is there a connection between that and entering into the rest? In other words, there are blessings that we have through Christ. They're ours. But we need to go in and take possession of it and make it our own. See, for Israel, you're either in the wilderness or in the land. For us, we are in the wilderness and in the land at the same time. 
And the idea is this, if we have all of these spiritual blessings in the heavenly places, in Christ Jesus, it's one thing to say, I have a million dollars in the bank and I'm like, you know, living in rags. That doesn't do you any good. And Christianity is not a theory. It's really grasping, okay, not really grasping. The truth, when the truth grasp my heart, it have impact. Christian that walking in this world with their head down, then something's wrong. I, I, we lost sight of something. If that doesn't mean that there is no difficult illnesses or household circumstances. or This is just a lot of the children of Adam because of sin. But there is a difference between Paul and Silas in prison and everybody else in prison. <laughs> Right. What is the difference? There is man who the truth of God have took a hold of him. He's resting. Yes, he's been beaten. I mean, you telling me it didn't hurt? It did hurt. You know, but there was something that raised him above the hurt. So when a believer going through a difficult time, what comfort us? What comfort us? The people of the world are using drugs. But we have these wonderful truths that are real. We will see them when we get there, but we might as well enjoy them now. So could we stand and sing him? Yes. 498? Yeah, yeah that's fine.